You asked for it, you got it. Welcome back to another oversimplified reaction video. And today, we're going to take a look at the final Mini Wars video that I have yet to review, which is the Emu War. If you have not seen any of my other reactions to oversimplified videos, which really, reaction is a difficult term to use because I really try to add something new and add some context uh, with my background in history. Uh, so I don't know a ton about the Great Emu War uh, of the 1930s, but I'll try to offer what I can, fill in some information, um, give a little bit more background, kind of de-simplify this a little bit. But there's links in the description to my other oversimplified reactions. Check those out if you would. And and if you're new to the channel, welcome. Look around. There's a nice mix of reaction content as well as original content, all focused around the idea of us learning more about history together. So I hope you enjoy. Let's dive into the Great Emu War from Oversimplified. This is Australia. For the man who imagines being strangled by a tarantula while a kangaroo breaks his kneecaps and thinks, Mmm, yes please. For the man who pictures himself being eaten by a snake in the burning outback while eating a Vegemite sandwich and thinks, Mmm, yes please. And that man was Governor Arthur Phillip, who landed in Eastern Australia in 1788, presumably saw a dingo being eaten by a crocodile, being eaten by a death adder, being eaten by a koala, being eaten by Mel Gibson, and thought to himself, Yes. Being eaten by by Mel Gibson. So yeah, um, you know Australia for my Australian friends, and I know we have a lot of you out there that follow this channel. Uh, Australia is viewed by much of the rest of us as this kind of wild place, even today, where there are giant spiders that will eat you. <laughs> my wife wants no part of ever going to Australia because she's seen pictures of. I guess you guys have a spider season. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, but yeah, Australia starts out uh, for the English as a penal colony, which is basically, um, if you look through the records at this point in history, in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, they had a very interesting way of dealing with criminals. Often they would do one of two things. If they didn't execute you for a number of crimes, um, they would put you on what was called a, a prison hulk, which was basically, if you imagine a, a big warship where they take all the stuff off the top, like the cannons and the sails and uh, all that stuff, and you're basically just left with the hull. And they park it in a river somewhere in, near a major city, and then they fill it with prisoners. That's a prison hulk. I had uh, uncles uh, who ended up in prison hulks at different times. Uh, the other thing they would do is send you to penal colonies. And Australia was one for a long time. Uh, Georgia in the United States was set up as a penal colony at one point. Uh, and of course, what we're going to get into today is a time when uh, a major nation went to war with flightless birds and lost. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Good. Now I know what you're thinking. But oversimplified, the British didn't discover Australia, the Vikings did. And you'd be wrong. I'm not sure why you'd think that. But hey, if you love Vikings so much, then why don't you check out today's uh, sponsor, okay. <laughs> Vikings War of Clans. Wondered where it was going with that. PC strategy and RPG games of the 90s we all loved, like Age of Empires and Civilization. If you, like me, want to relive those memories again with a new experience, then this mobile game is for you. Vikings lets you choose your own playstyle, and what makes its world so addictive is that more than 20 million online players are constantly changing the way it evolves by never-ending fighting over resources, forging new alliances, and competing in live events. Events. Support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links that in the description yet. box below and get the special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Bye, bye. Man, this is great. The market will continue to grow forever. But what if it doesn't? Oh crap, I never thought of that. Sell, sell. 1929. And the stock market crashed, which led to economic downturn, which meant banks wouldn't lend anyone any money, which led to more economic downturn, which meant everyone stopped buying stuff, which led to more economic downturn. So, yeah, it's a spiral of stuff that goes out of control that leads to the Great Depression. Interestingly, before the Great Depression was the Great Depression, there was another Great Depression. It happened in the 1870s. Uh, there was a panic, uh, very similar in a lot of ways to this one. Um, it wasn't quite as worldwide as the Great Depression was in the 19th. 1930s, uh, but they called it the Great Depression, that one in the 1870s, until this one came along. 
Pernin. Hey, what if all the crops in the Great Plains were destroyed in a drought and then a big dust storm engulfed the area? That's right, more economic downturn. And in an effort to combat the crisis, America began imposing tariffs on foreign imports, which made the economic downturn go global, and the earth got really depressed. But one nation that was hit harder than most by the whole affair, Australia. The problem for Australia was that it relied heavily on its export industries, and in the current economic climate, no one was buying. To make things worse, Australia had introduced its own currency and pegged it onto the gold standard via the British pound. But then the UK started messing with its own peg on the gold standard, and if this is starting to sound confusing, then let me oversimplify it for you. Hey UK, looks like my car is broken down. Wanna give me a tow? No problem, friend. I got you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's about it, that's about right. More economic downturn. The point I'm trying to make is things weren't good, and in particular, it was Australia's farmers that were suffering most. After the First World War, Australia had given returning veterans land for farming, but with the current economic crisis, the farmers... So much... There's a parallel here between uh, the United States after the American Revolution uh, and Australia after World War One. What does Australia have a lot of? Land. Now, a lot of the center... Uh, of the country uh, is not really good for uh, land, like farming and things like that. But uh, but there's still a lot of it there and not a lot of people to occupy it. And so what they have in abundance to be able to reward people with is land. The same thing happened after the American Revolution. Uh, when the revolution was won by the United States, uh, everything west of the Appalachian Mountains is now fair game, whereas the British had made it off limits and set it aside for the Native Americans. Uh, so now the U.S. government is giving these huge land grants to uh, men who served in the army during the war uh, because they've got lots of land. Farmers just weren't making enough money and many left to go find work in the cities. But for those who remained, things were about to get even worse. The emus. Before we get into that, it's time for some cultural exchange. My national bird is the bald eagle. It's a strong patriotic symbol of America and a deeply valued and protected species. My national bird is the peafowl. It's a beautiful creature whose vivid colors represent India. So we list it as a protected species. My national bird is the emu and it's a pest. Also bloody delicious. <laughs> Emus, six feet tall, 90 to 120 pounds, and able to run at speeds up to 40 miles per hour, usually return to the coast after their breeding season. But suddenly they found Western Australia full of lush, wet farmland. So not only six feet tall and can run 40 miles an hour, which is crazy fast. I mean, this is a flightless bird that is as tall as a human that can run faster than humans can. Uh, and they also apparently are bulletproof, but we'll get to that. Oh my, look at all this delicious wheat that just so happens to be growing here in large quantities. Hey guys, get a load of this. Mm. You know my, oh, look wow. at all this oh, delicious wheat yeah. that just so happens to be growing here in large quantities. Hey guys, get a load of this. You know my, look at all this delicious wheat that just so happens to be growing here in large quantities. Hey guys, get a load of this. You know my, look at all this delicious wheat that just so happens to be growing here in large quantities. Hey guys, get a load of this. You know my, look at all this delicious wheat that just so happens to be growing here in large quantities. Hey, who left this big hole in the fence? Guys, get a load of this. Oh wow. Oh, it's really 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 20,000 emus cost the already struggling farmers millions more pounds in lost crops and damages. Only 20,000 of these things, but they're huge. Imagine if you looked out the door uh, at your farm and you saw a bunch of six foot birds running around eating your stuff. I mean, where do you even begin to deal with that? The situation couldn't continue like this. Something had to be done. So in 1932, the farmers turned to the government for help. You'd think they'd go to the Minister of Agriculture, but these farmers said no. This is a job for the, the military. The army. So they went to George Pierce, the Minister of Defense. That's right, Australia was to go to war with the emus. But not everyone was happy with the idea. This is barbaric. We can't go slaughtering thousands of our own national bird. Oh, come on, guys. The machine guns will make it quick and painless. Machine guns? You're using machine guns? This is animal cruelty. Look, I know it's unusual, but it's not like we're poachers turning the birds into feather hats. Think of the benefits. It'll be good target practice for our boys. The government can show it took action. Plus, I can get myself a nice new feather hat. Uh, did I say feather hat? I meant I want to gather chat with you. 
about getting you all some nice new feather hats. Uh, did I say feather hats? I meant I want to wage terror at these emus and turn them all into feather hats. Damn it! <laughs> of course, Pierce first made the farmers sign an agreement saying that they would pay for the whole thing and that Pierce wouldn't take any of the blame if the operation that was clearly very stupid turned out to indeed be stupid. So, typical politician, right? I, I want to get all the credit if it goes right, but none of the blame if it goes wrong. And the operation went ahead. Major GPW Meredith and his men were sent with two Lewis machine guns to hunt down and take out the evil emu population in Western Australia. Target spotted. Well, was it an emu? No, sir. It's an emo. Damn it, Jones. Learn your vowels. I'm sorry. Okay, it looks like the humans are coming for us. But check this out. I've come up with an amazing plan. See if you can follow me here, okay? When they approach, we run away. Sir? You're a genius. You're a genius. sent a camera crew along with the machine gunners to capture some good old propaganda for the government. And the first battle took place in November at Campion. The men spotted a mob of emus from a distance, so they set up their guns and opened fire. The emus split up into smaller groups and ran in every direction. The men were only able to kill what they called a number of birds, but the vast majority got away. Cut. I don't know why you think only two is going to be enough, because they're going to scatter. Uh... You're dealing with 20,000 of these things. Why can't you send in like at least a battalion or something? I don't know. Surprisingly, many of the emus were able to take multiple bullets, but still run at full speed to safety, Bulletproof. causing Meredith to compare them to tanks, saying if we had a military division with the bullet carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. Okay, we need to get closer. No, you idiots, <laughs> not to me, to the emus. Oh, sorry. No, no. I like it. So next, they tried sneaking up on a large number of emus near a local dam and firing at short range. Maybe the men were just unlucky, but my professional opinion says the emus were magic because both guns jammed after just 12 emus were killed. And once again, the rest That's got away. That's crazy. Again, you're using two guns. What? Maybe they thought that sending more would be overkill and it would be bad optics. I don't know. Cut. The men were feeling a little humiliated after losing to a pack of discount ostriches, so they decided to move further south, where the emus were said to be tamer. And this time, they had a new strategy. Okay, Jones, here's the plan. You mount the machine gun in the back, I'll chase the emus, you shoot. Mechanized Got it? warfare. Got it. That went well. I'm gonna shove that camera up your... The operation was a fiasco. So speaking of mechanized warfare, I, I can't speak to other nations, but I know in the history of the United States military, uh, the first person to employ the idea of mechanized warfare, in other words, or mobile warfare, uh, using a vehicle uh, to carry out an attack was actually George Patton. George Patton is a lieutenant uh, serving on the staff of General Pershing uh, in uh, an incursion by the U.S. military into northern Mexico to try and uh, get Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa had raided into the United States, killed some American citizens, and so the U.S. military was sent into Mexico to deal with him. And Patton actually gets a bunch of guys onto a car and they go driving into this ranch, guns blazing. Uh, and it's the first time that an attack like that was carried out by the U.S. military. And the press had a field day. In Parliament, Pierce was lambasted, and an opposition party member suggested that medals should be handed out to the emus, who had won every <laughs> round so far. Pierce. <laughs> that is brilliant politics right there. I mean, and, and I've always loved how, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing Australia's par Parliament is similar to how they do it in the UK. Uh, I've always loved that style of democracy better than uh, the uh, republic that we have in the United States where everything's like there's decorum and all that stuff in the house. I, I love how they do it there. Uh, and for this guy to stand up and call his opposition out like that by saying, we should give medals to the emus for winning these battles. It's fantastic. Feeling quite humiliated, pulled the operation off. But four days later, the farmers approached again and said, hey man, the emus are still eating all our crops. Can you send the army back out here? And Pierce was like, yeah, okay. So the operation was back on for round two. And this time Meredith and his men had learned the emus' guerrilla tactics and were much more successful, with reports suggesting the men were cutting down 300 emus every week. I hope you boys are getting great footage of this. What on earth are you filming? Despite the success, the media had lost interest in the whole thing. But with what? A thousand... 
Mel Gibson eating a koala? Come on. Oh, boy. When the emus killed, Pierce finally ended the operation and returned to Parliament declaring victory for the humans. So there were 20... All right, and so the mission accomplished thing uh, is a, uh, a reference to... Um, in the early days of the war in Iraq, uh, in 2003, 2004, that time period, um, there was this, what turned out to be a really bad uh, visual stunt, uh, where you have George W. Bush, who's president of the United States at the time, um, and had been a, a fighter pilot uh, in his younger days, um, coming in, landing on an aircraft carrier uh, in a fighter plane. Uh, and there's this big banner that says, Mission Accomplished. Uh, and, of course, they'll argue that it was actually the mission of that uh, aircraft carrier that was accomplished. They weren't claiming that the war was won because we all know in hindsight it certainly was not at that point. But that's a reference to it. 3,000 emus out there destroying crops, and you've killed a 1,000. Mm-hmm. Meaning there's still 19,000 emus out there. Yep. And in addition, you've burned through 10,000 rounds of ammunition. Uh-huh. Meaning you wasted 10 rounds per confirmed kill. That's right. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call this one for the emus. At least I got a feather hat. Now, honestly, I will say this. 10 rounds per confirmed kill when you're dealing with birds that can run 40 miles an hour that can take multiple bullets before they go down. And, and when you look at the stats on how many rounds are expended per kill in war, it's honestly not that bad. In fact, let's take a look at that real quick. So I looked up a couple of, of different resources. Apparently, uh, some estimates for World War II are that 45,000 rounds were expended for every person killed in World War II. In Vietnam, for the U.S., it was about 50,000 rounds for every person killed. Uh, so 10 per? It's honestly not that bad. What? What? So in the end, the emus won the Great Emu War of 1932. And the emus continued to wreak havoc on the farmers for years to come. The government introduced a bounty system, which saw some success. But for a moment, let's take some time to remember the brave men who said goodbye to their families and risked their lives to take on the great, evil, emu population in Western Australia. Look at those Lewis guns. Those are huge. And the guy's got it mounted on somebody's shoulder. I would think, I mean, because machine guns, very historically, get super hot when they're fired for a, a lengthy period of time. A lot of them, they started to end up developing cooling systems to, to help keep them firing longer. But you couldn't have been able to do that on somebody's shoulder for very long. But even more importantly, let's think of the friends they made, the bond they created, and the memories they shared. I think the emu war went for like six weeks total. To go to fields <laughs> oh my god. What is happening right now? It's where the heart lies with stories on. Hey, uh, guys, I solved the emu crisis. Really? How? I just made some better fences. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was awesome. All right, so don't forget, uh, check out the original content. I put a link in the description to the original video. Make sure you subscribe to them if you haven't already. Uh, and check out some of my other reactions to Oversimplified in the description below. And please consider becoming a patron. Uh, shout out to all of our fantastic patrons, nearly 300 of you now. We've got a goal of getting to 500 by the end of the year. Hopefully you can be a part of that. Thanks for watching.